Welcome to the UK Beef Webinar Series, Shooting the Bull. This is where we answer all of your beef-related questions. We are going to begin the program with Dr. Kenny Burdine talking about the current market situation. Um, I was watching five weeks. Here's my baseline there. That, that steers in the $1.70 state average. Value-added groups, $1.80 to $1.90, somewhere in that range. Uh, you know, if you really look at how much things have changed cost-wise, and I thought Greg did a really good job with this article back, back in April, and just talked about the impact for cow-calf operations. We would need about a 30 cent difference per pound on calves this fall versus last fall to offset that. I think it's gonna be tough to get there, but I think we'll be close. That same five weight steer sold for about $1.55 back last fall, he's 20 cents higher now. I think he'll hold pretty well between now and now and the end of the year. My, my guess is fourth quarter, he's somewhere in the $1.70, $1.80 range. So I think we'll see a stronger calf market, but I don't think it's gonna be quite enough to offset what we're gonna pay in terms of particularly fertilizer cost on the hay side and then you know what feeds purchased and of course fuel as well. That'd be my take for what it's worth. Outlook for heavy feeders is better. Um, you know, really good opportunities right now. We're moving, we're moving heavy feeders already good prices, and we've got quite a bit of carrying aboard. So we could easily see, I think, another dime on these heavy feeder cattle prices between now and say October or so. So we're kind of in a weird spot. And I'm, I'm almost done, sorry, but we're we're kind of in a weird spot where dry weather is pulling so many cattle forward. Um, we're, we're losing cows left and right, but at the same time, we're still finding ways to, to process cattle because so many of them are moving marketplace. So that's, that's kind of where we are. We're in an odd place, but there's no doubt that this is not sustainable given how many cows that we're moving. And we're going to see supply reductions big time, probably as early as second half of the year. So that's going to have price implications going forward for sure. You're muted there. Thanks. Uh, in most situations, you know, it, it seems to me like the best marketing strategy is is kind of to to do the opposite of everybody else, because when everybody else is, you know, selling out and getting out of the business, because you know the the prices are low, well, you know that they're that's going to cause things to turn around. So you probably should stay in this. This one's a little trickier for me to get my, my hands around because my head around, because the, the costs are so high this go around. And so um, even though the prices on the face of them look pretty good, it, it's still really scary with, with the costs that we have out there. So it is probably a little different than other situations like this, I, I guess. Is, would you agree? I would, and there's always different ways to look at this, but, you know, one thing that I always kind of look at is, you know, we've got, we've got almost an unprecedented cull cow market right now, right? The cull cow market is just crazy, bull market strong. We've kind of got the perfect storm on the cow side, right? We've got, we've had really three or four frustrating years of the cow-calf sector back to back. We've got dry weather in a lot of the U.S. that's pulling a lot of cows. At the same time, we've got really high cull cow prices, so there's a lot of incentive to unload cows. I like to kind of look at though cull cow values versus versus younger breeding stock values, bred heifers, and, and even younger mature cows. And relatively speaking, younger breeding stock right now looks looks like a decent buy to me given what the cull cow market is. So you know something I've talked to folks about on occasion has been you know if you want to be in the cow calf business, you know this is probably a good time to think about upgrading your herd, meaning unloading some of those older cows or placing them with some you know some good young breeding stock, and set yourself up to have a good young herd over the next you know I don't know three to five years because the truth of the matter is the way we're calling this cow herd, you know we're going to see lower beef production levels for several years going forward, so we should see some really nice calf prices once we work through this glutted cattle we're dealing with right now. Yeah. One, one more point to ponder, and then I'm, I'm going to give you a break. But the other thing that, that I notice about that's different this go around than a lot of other price fluctuation times is the fact that, that prices of, of beef in the grocery store <laughs> are outrageous 
and you would have thought, I mean, usually it, they tend to follow a little closer in terms of, of what consumers are having to pay with what producers are getting. And uh, this time they can't fuss at the farmer and say, we're having to pay so much, you guys must be getting rich. Uh, somebody must be. Those have been out of balance for a while. Um, six to 12 months ago, the box beef price was very high relative to the farm level price. And that's actually come down quite a bit. In fact, box beef prices are off quite a bit from where they were um, this time last year and even back in the winter. But what's not come down is that retail price. So really it's that gap between the wholesale value right now and retail that's the widest. And you know, so there's there's two ways to look at that. You know, one, one is the idea that okay, you know, why is that the case? But the truth of matter is it's the case because folks are paying that. I guess you know the only the only good news about something like that is it does speak to relatively strong beef demand. It's been frustrating because we're seeing inflation in a lot of markets, but cattle, frankly, have been a little late to the party, it seems like. And it seems like they're gonna kind of be delayed when we get there. The only good news about those high retail prices is it does speak to the fact that consumers are paying that. Right. Um, and, you know, one more comment. And I watched that retail series that USDA puts out, and there, there's some value in tracking that. It's a really weird series, though. You know, like I think right now the average retail price based on USDA numbers is something over $7 a pound. And, and that's kind of a weighted average of everything. But, you know, at the same time, Beef has really become a loss leader in so many markets. And I don't know how good a job that retail series does capturing some of that featuring that goes on. Just anecdotally, I can go to the grocery store here near me. And most any time I can find a good buy on two or three meat products. It might be ground beef one week. It might be ribeyes one week. It might be roast one week. And I think a lot of volume moves when it's featured like that to generate traffic. And I've always thought that retail series is probably a little bit suspect anyway for that reason. Sure. All right. If you guys have any other questions for Kenny, be sure and put them in the chat if you would, and uh, and and we'll we'll get them on the air. Uh, Dr. Arnold, can you bring us kind of up to date? For those that don't know, Dr. Arnold's also out at the diagnostic lab, so sees a lot of what goes through and all. Is there anything in particular you guys have been seeing that's concerning or? Um, or, or just a little bit of everything. So this is this is the time of year when we don't have a lot of cattle come through um, at the lab. I think I mentioned earlier that um, when it's this hot, when it's this hot, they just they decompose so fast that um, it's it's we we discourage it if it's been over twenty four hours. If it's been dead over twenty four hours, so. Most of the time, most of the time people find them late, <laughs> too late to come where it would be of any value. I mean, then we, they could bring them, but, but the testing is basically worthless. So, so there's not been a lot. However, the, maybe one interesting thing that um, was brought to my attention yesterday by the state vet is this new organism that causes a, um, a disease very similar to anaplasmosis. And uh, it's a, it is a, it's a protozoan, and I've got the name here because I literally can't ever say it right. Uh, Thylaria, Thylaria orientalis, uh, Aikida. It's a tick-borne protozoan, and it is associated with this Asian longhorn tick that um, <clears throat> we've seen in Kentucky. We've had it around. Well, this is the disease that that this tick can carry. Um, but like I said, really similar to anaplasmosis, except anaplasm is a bacteria and responds to uh, tetracycline, and this does not have a treatment. This is a protozoan parasite. Um, infects the red blood cells. This one actually infects white blood cells, too, um, that causes an anemia. So they had a case of it in uh, Middle Tennessee. They've had several cases in Virginia. And uh, so the, the, question, the question came up of what, what are we going to do in Kentucky because we're bound to see it. Um, and again, it looks a lot like anaplasmosis. The, the difference is um, this one can hit calves where anaplas generally is not, is not important in calves, but it, it will, uh, this, this disease will cause problems. Um, 
it, so diagnostically, we're looking at we can we can send whole blood off to Kansas State or Virginia Tech or Cornell for a PCR to get it diagnosed. Probably Kansas State's got the best um, situation because if we send a whole blood sample, they'll test for both thalaria and anaplas at the same time, since the diseases are very similar in presentation. But um, so, uh, so the big focus is to make sure producers pay attention to ticks. You know that that this tick, this Asian longhorn tick, uh, reproduces. You know we've only, we've only found females in the United States because they can reproduce without a male. Um, <clears throat> what's that called? Parth parthenogenesis or something of that nature. But uh, they reproduce without a male, so they reproduce very quickly. And um, they can, we had a, a case or two last year in the lab of, um, where the ticks had multiplied so quickly that it, it, caused, it caused the um, heifers to die. You know, it actually bled them out. So... <clears throat> So just, I mean, in most of the, most of the porons we use, fly control will, will control ticks too. So you just need to be vigilant and make sure that they've got, you know, they've got some treatment on, especially when you're going into fields like um, that are around woods, you know, that, that you're on the edge of woods. Think about places where you normally see ticks. Um, that's where you're going to, that's where they're going to encounter ticks most often. So it's kind of the new the new thing um, that we're supposed to I'm actually supposed to meet the state vet tomorrow and talk about what we should do if we should have surveillance if we should um, you know how how to go about tracking this because I think it, it's going to be here it, it'll be here sooner probably sooner rather than later. Well, it's the the whole tick thing's kind of getting a little crazy. I even saw where the entomology department at UK, you can send your ticks to them in the mail um, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and get back if they have any uh, illnesses and all. I mean, that's for, I guess, humans, dogs, your cattle, whatever. <laughs> whatever, yeah. And we, we actually get quite a few ticks into the lab and send them over uh, to okay. entomology or they come get them one or the other. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, that's, Something to bear in mind if, if things coming down the pike. Um, we're also supposed to meet tomorrow, have a, a pretty good sized meeting with the state vet and, and stakeholders about the shortage of large animal veterinarians, which they seem to be getting fewer and farther between. And that's going to be important because next year, next year, all the antibiotics go off from over the counter. You know, we won't be able to get tetracycline we won't be able to get LA 200 LA 300 next year it'll all come off it all goes under prescription so it's going to be important at that point that you at least know one you at least know a bit where you can get it you get medications you need yeah that is going to that uh, that vet producer relationship is going to become even more important. I mean, it, it, we all know that it's always been important, but um, but you're right. I mean, needing a vet for for everything uh, that that is going to increase that, hopefully improve those relationships because they are important. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but they're few and far between for a reason. I mean, they can they can make so much more money um, in small animal. It's it's hard to close that gap. It's hard to close that financial gap, and I don't know how to do it. I don't know how the the state can, you know, they propose maybe doing some um, loan forgiveness and things like that if they'll go into a shortage area. But um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. Yep. It's it, it's it's it's. A problem that's been here just about as long as I have, and I doubt it's going to go away anytime soon. It's probably gotten worse over time. So right, right. All right, uh, Dr. Lim Cooler, I'm going to pick on you. What what exciting's happening in the world of nutrition these days, my friend? Hmm. Well, feed prices continue to be reflective of fertilizer prices, and there's a lot of discussion and concern about 
potential for hay shortage. Um, the kind of cool wet spring we had reduced yields on some of the early cut hay. Uh, this hot weather we're having right now is going to cause some of the pastures to uh, go dormant and that second cutting yield may be a little bit light as well. Um, a lot of hay was getting mowed down today. Um, Dr. Anderson and I were over in eastern Kentucky and there was a lot getting mowed down on our drive over. So that is going to probably be a little lower quality. Yield will probably be there, but um, you know, when we when we look across that field and we can begin seeing the seed heads turning from green to tan, we know that the the stem that's holding that seed head up has moved basically in the fescue straw quality. So um, uh, it's an offset of yield and, and quality. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, trying to remember now the exact date, the 13th of May, I did some grab samples. Uh, so we're right at a month ago. I did some grab samples and some pastures. They all came out 14 to 17% protein. And in the 58 to 62 TDN range. Um, I suspect if I were to go pull samples of that hay today, because I've done it in the past, uh, we'd be looking at seven to eight percent protein and TDN in that 52 to 54 range. And, and the major dilution is not the leaves. The leaves still maintain pretty good quality, but that stem fraction, when we've tested it, comes in about four, four and a half percent protein, and then the high 30s, low 40s on TDN. So yeah, we're getting material put in a bale, but um, you know, that that one little kind of stem there makes up about 40 to 50 percent of the biomass uh, in this hay that we're putting up as first cutting right now. So I'd encourage folks to think about looking for um, carryover hay. Um, there is some hay that folks had that was carryover last year, and you might be able to find an opportunity to buy some of that here before prices get too high. There's already been some discussions that I've heard the uh, equivalent hay prices pushing over $100 a ton. Um, and I think part of that is Dr. Toich and, and our forage experts have said there's about $70 to $80 per ton in fertilizer value. So you add another, what, Dr. Burdine, 30 to $40 a ton and cut rake bale. And so we're pushing up there in that hundred plus dollars a ton on hay costs. So um, try, to, try to stretch our forage reserves the best that we can and, and use that uh, as a, a cheap feed source. And then really get your pencil out and begin pushing your pencil to make sure that um, we're keeping the nutrition up on the cow so that they breed back and they're productive. Um, but we're also not wasting money on maybe protein when we maybe don't need protein. Maybe it's calories in that cheapest calorie we can find right now. So that, it, what sounds important to me, Jeff, especially with prices the way they are. I mean, we talk about people needing to, to test their hay and, and then supplement appropriately you know compared to what they have and everything you know for so is it even more important with high prices that people get their hay cut right so that they can probably limit some of that supplementation as much as possible absolutely um the the discussion currently though is with high diesel prices where we're at it's um you know, you're running across the cut, you're running across the Ted, you're running across the rake, you're running across the bale, and that all takes diesel. And so the, the normal trade-off mentality then is to, to go for tonnage and, and reduce the quality, maybe just a tad. So I, I think, you know, as we look at it, it's never an easy solution there. And, um, you know, I would encourage folks to think about a second cutting if they can manage that. If we look like we break in this weather and we're going to get precipitation in the next couple of weeks, um, you know, you, you could think about a shot of nitrogen down right before good heavy rain, you know, half inch to an inch to try and boost the yields and quality on that second cut. But um, the other option is to always be thinking about what the forge folks will tell us on that fall stockpile. And, um, you know, we, we need to be thinking and 
now because August is going to be here before we know it. And August is that prep time for thinking about stockpiling to extend that grazing into the fall and winter, especially on those. I, I think stockpiling we, is an overlooked um, kind of supplement when we think about these fall calving cows, because if we can turn in November, December, that's about the time these cows are hitting peak and about the time that Dr. Anderson wants them to get rebred. And that stockpile is almost always a couple percentage protein units higher and, and three to four percentage units higher in TDN. Good, excellent points. Uh, now, let me remind everybody, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, please. And uh, you can just make them general and we'll figure out who they need to go to, or you can direct them to uh, one of us specifically, if, if you would like. Uh, Dr. Van Valen, can you you have anything to follow up on what uh, Jeff was saying, or did, did he get it right, or do you need to help him out a little bit? No, he uh, he got it. He got it right. But, uh, you know, I'll emphasize a, a couple points. And, you know, I just ran some numbers for, for one of our agents this morning who had a producer that had um, some questions kind of based on on pricing his um, I think you know they were seeing hay prices in that 150 a ton range where they were at and and so really starting to kind of understand um, you know balancing feeding hay with feeding a supplement and, and what was going to be the most economical you know decision there and, and so that was something that you know we were able to, to do some calculations and kind of show them some differences based on the, the feed stuffs that they have available. Um, really under, understanding that, you know, we've had a luxury of in the past of being able to over supplement protein with some of our, our feed stuffs, like a, a distillish grain or something like that, where right now with feed costs where they are and, and forage production costs where they are, we really don't have that, that luxury to, to overfeed that. So being able to, to get the hay tested and understand exactly how much energy versus Meat, which ultimately we have to do to to keep condition on them and and keep them breeding for us so um i would say now more than ever is time to to get hay tested this year and and make sure that we're making some good informed decisions as we go in you hit mute there a little quick on us katie um let katie, me... i had i had one that came in today and um, i'm going to share with you. So um, for our backgrounding um, folks and our feeders, um, the question came in, your, your thoughts about moving feeding from morning to evening? Yep, that's a, a good question. And, and it's something that, you know, we've seen some of the research in, in feeder cattle where we can change that time that we're feeding those cattle when we get into these really hot temperatures. Um, you know, after those cattle consume a meal, you know, I think our, our thought is, is let's feed them in the morning. It's cool. They'll get up and eat. Well, being ruminants, they're going to produce quite a bit of heat and that's on a, a delay of, of several hours. So if we start doing that math now, all of a sudden they've got their heat, uh, their peak fermentation going on in the middle of the day when it's the hottest um, weather wise, and then they're also producing the most heat. So um, there has been some some research done to look at at shifting feeding to later in the the afternoon or evening. So now, by the time they reach that that heat production or that peak of heat production, now we're later into the evening. And so, um, you know, that's something that that we've got some um, heifers that are getting supplemented right now at the station, and we're you know looking at moving them over to to an afternoon. And so one of the things that I do with that group is I kind of do it over a couple a few days we split a, an a.m and a p.m and then now they'll they'll all be over on p.m the other thing that we can try to do from a, a feeding strategy standpoint is if we do have any uh, novel and to fight fescues or any fields that have a little less fescue in it than, than others certain or more shade uh, access some of those things can really uh, help make a difference when we've got those cattle experiencing the, the heat that we've got going on now and is looking to be even worse next week. 
to, to follow up on that, Katie, you're you're our minerals guru. What, what impacts the heat have on on like mineral consumption, and and does it change in terms of uh, requirements or anything like that when we get this hot? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that that we know is that mineral intake is going to be pretty variable th throughout the year, um, and so certainly when it gets hot like this uh, if we've got mineral close to the water source then we might be getting you know helping with some of that consumption um, as those cattle go to the water source um, but some of the work that's been done uh, in heat stress cattle actually shows that um, they have lower absorption of some of those minerals uh, when they get into some of these heat stress environments so um, that can can certainly be a complicating factor we also think about um, you know, causing them to, to lose some of the, those mineral stores that they have uh, in their bodies as well. So, um, you know, it's one of those where I, I always tell folks to, to keep the mineral out there, keep it in front of the, the water source. But um, certainly, you know, I would, I would not be surprised if we saw some differences in mineral intake uh, as, it, as it starts to get warmer, the cattle spend more time, you know, tucked up in the shade if, if it's available to them and that kind of thing. Excellent. Dr. Anderson, so glad we can now see your pretty face. Uh, what you got going on the repro side? Cows love to get bred this time of year, don't they? Yeah, first time I've ever heard that guy. I'd love to see your pretty face. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's not a good time to be a repro guy. <laughs> His heat stress is is gonna going to be a disastrous for our spring breeding um, opportunities, particularly when it's coming so early, right? I mean, we're used to hitting heat stress first of July. Um, and one of my, you know, goals is for most of our spring calvers to have their um, breeding season basically over by the first of July. Hit them toward the middle of, you know, first round, middle of May, second round, June 10th to June 15th, and you'll have 85% of them bred by then, hopefully. And you just got a few stragglers to pick up. But coming this early, I mean, it, it, folks better better get their cattle preg checked this year. I just, I mean, go ahead and think about it. Go ahead and plan on it. Uh, get your technician, your veterinarian ready to go. Um, if nothing else, get get figure out how to do the blood sampling. We've got shoot side blood tests now. You, you can still send them in to the diagnostic lab, Dr. Arnold, or to uh, several different places. Um, but you need, I mean, you, you need to, to really, you got to plan on doing those preg checks this year. The other thing I would do, and I, I, I know particularly the next two weeks, um, you're not going to see much activity in the cattle. Um, the bulls are going to be doing 90% of whatever work they do right now, they're going to do between midnight and 3 a.m. And uh, and so it's going to be difficult. But watch, just really watch the cows. Um, do the best you can to trying to identify whether, you know, it's, we, we always think about heat behavior in cows, but we rarely think about breeding behavior in bulls. And when it's hot and they're miserable, they're not, they're, they're not going to really get after it. And we, we need to keep our eye on, on everything and make sure, uh, make sure that our cows are having an opportunity to get bred and, and plan and prepare. And, and Kenny, you know, you know, you brought it up earlier and I skipped a little bit there in the middle because my internet went out, but, um, we, uh, this is a time to be efficient. I mean, there's always a time to be efficient, right, Dr. Burdine? I mean, there's never a great time to be uh, uh, to not, to be inefficient. And so, when the prices are high and 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 we have an opportunity to profit, if you're efficient, then you're going to make more money. If you're if prices are low, then maybe you'll break even, but at least you won't lose your shirt. And you know, we we really, you know, Kenny talked about. You know, taking an opportunity to correct your cows, it, you'd be amazed at how how much better your cow herd gets if you cut the bottom twenty five percent off. Okay, um, and you know now would be an opportunity to to really.
focus in on your efficiencies and making sure that the, your herd is functioning at, at the highest possible level. And, you know, I back, you know, several years ago and Jeff and, and Katie, I want you guys to chime in on this to overcome some heat stress issues. We actually were feeding fat, which seems to be counterproductive because fat has a lot of energy, you know, and you think, you know, you'd want less heat, heat increment and so forth. But we actually saw higher preg rates in our really highly stressed uh, cows when we were feeding them three to five pounds, either whole soybeans or some sort of fat supplement that had a high linoleic acid. So I don't know, would that be an op an, an option for now? Absolutely. You know, fat is a good way to increase caloric density that has a lower metabolic heat um, value in it. So, and it, it doesn't take a lot of fat because there's, you know, 2.2 times the amount of energy in a, in a quantity of fat as there is um, in a calorie of, of something else. So, or not calorie, but in a, a quantity of something else. The, the challenge is watch it. You know, the, I think Katie and I can both tell you uh, free, free choice syrup out there right now is not the way to go either necessarily because as they get really hot, uh, there was some nice work, Katie, that was done out of Iowa State um, looking at uh, distiller syrup and cattle are opportunistic just like we are. When it gets hot, they're going to go over there to that trough and suck down a whole lot more syrup and get more fat intake than they need to and have a negative effect on fermentation in the room. And when the weather's cool, the grass is plentiful, their intake is low. So um, I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan per se of unlimited free choice fat supplements this time of the year you need to kind of use a little bit of of common sense with that yeah and you know any other things that we kind of haven't you know really touched on and and this will probably bring dr bulk into the conversation as well with some of the new genetic tools on this topic but um you know looking at hair coat you know shedding and, and scores certainly those cattle that are, are retaining that hair coat, especially those that are, are black. Um, you know, have a, a, hard, a harder time dealing with the, these heat stress events, um, you know, as we move forward. Yeah, there, I, I think that it's, it's actually one of the very undervalued things. The hair coat thing's important, but, but that red versus black is pretty incredible. Uh, in, in terms of, of, you know, the amount of heat that, that they absorb, you know, with the black cattle absorbing way more heat, having elevated body temperatures. Uh, the hair coat thing, that, that's, a, that's another one. It's a new tool that um, I, I know that Angus is, now has an EPD on it, and I wouldn't be surprised if others uh, come out with it. And, and so it is a way to select to, to get better shedding uh, in your cattle as well, which is, is going to continue to be an issue, I'm afraid. This, this, I don't think this year is a one-off. I'm afraid this is what we're going to be with for a while. So uh, we, we're, we're going to have to help our cattle adapt to it. So we could wait around less and just, you know, call them when they don't breed. But uh, I'd rather us help them adapt to it a little bit if we can. Yeah. Do you want me to go ahead and answer that question now? Yeah, that'd be great. So do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? Oh, I'll read it. I've got it up okay. here. So Dar yep. Dar had a, a question come in and it looks like it's from John Edwards, but it may be another Jay Edwards. Uh, John's a good friend of ours down in Hardin County. Uh, but anyway, uh, had, it said I had two first calf heifers, both fall calved and raised the calf. He waited 90 days post calving to sink an AI, which is, you know, a little a little late. But if you're jumping, if you're jump starting your heifers calving, that's pretty normal. I did a seven day cedar regimen and uh, put heat patches on them, and neither one of them came in heat. He just let them go over until spring breeding, synced them again, heat patch, and again no heat. Um, don't know what happened. I have not had that problem with any other animals. Um, you know, the first, the first lack of estrus would, you know, I would blame on an estrus, okay? That, you know, two-year-olds milking heavy, doing a good job. 
with their cows. I mean, I have I have seen 210 days after a two-year-old is calved and she's still not cycling. Okay. And so it it takes on average 90 to 120 days for those for those gals to get in. Now, you know, um, since you cedared them, you gave them you know, the, uh, the, the recommended protocol to overcome anesthesia um, and having 90 days is normally enough to get that done. Uh, but I would have still blamed that on, you know, that the heifers were, were just milking really heavy and just hadn't overcome um, that, uh, you know, normal postpartum anesthesia yet. Now, why they didn't come in heat in the spring, I'm not gonna lie to you, that's, that's pretty puzzling. Um, couple of things uh, about it is you, you have a small population there's just two and um, you know estrus is a behavior and a behavior is can be affected by a lot of things other than you know I mean you know certainly weather nothing's going to be hardly going to be coming in heat now um, any sort of stressor is going to reduce the uh, the, uh, the an animal's ability uh, or desire to come in heat, to show heat. Most of the time, I mean, the science is pretty clear. Most of the time they ovulate and everything normally, they, they just won't show estrus. And so, you know, you said you sold them. Um, and so that's taken care of. But, you know, one of the things about timed AI is that uh, sometimes the timed AI will overcome some of these issues with a lack of estrus uh, expression. And so, um, I would go ahead and just, you know, when you do your seven day cedar regimen, make sure you follow that up with a timed AI, um, whether that's, you know, check heat and AI for 72 hours and clean up at 84 or whatever you want to do, we just go ahead and hit that timed AI in there at the end. And maybe that'll pick up some of these females that, that, that have a hard time coming in heat. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Kevin, are you with us, buddy? You're, you're down there in the corner. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, we got we you. We had the internet. Y'all hear me okay? Yeah, um, I think I, I think I think we got you. Uh, keeping my video off to hopefully keep this internet in there going. But, uh, you know, just I've just been sitting back and listening to the discussion. And, you know, a lot of things, you know, as we get into these high input costs and high prices, we're, you know, just making sure you're talking about efficiency less you know, trying to be efficient, trying to make sure our calves are ready to market this fall um, is really paramount. I know we're in the middle of this, this huge heat wave right now, but don't lose sight of, you know, maybe a midsummer deworming and working. <clears throat> you know, we get into, hopefully we can get on the other side of this heat and we'll catch, you know, 50 degree morning and, you know, and might be a great time get those cows up and uh, maybe implant and deworm those calves through a targeted deworming, you know, and there's some research that shows that could boost your weaning weights uh, at, at weaning time. Um, also might be a great time to pull that bull unless, you know, and, uh, you know, you maybe could couple those, those practices, you know, together there. Um, maybe reinforce your fly control on the cow herd at the same time. So, I mean, there's some things, I think, you know, don't lose sight, don't get depressed. And it's, it's easy to get depressed and it's just high cost. Um, I did want to just talk about, you know, something that Kenny touched on earlier uh, with replacement costs. You know, we had our bread heifer sale at Guthrie in May, May 21st. And it's interesting what replacement, and I know this isn't an exact science by any stretch, Kenny, and, and you know, I'm sure you would agree, but it was funny. I was talking to Tim Dietrich. You know, they had a, a pretty large commercial female sale in, I think, the end of March, 1st of April, and they were averaging well over 2,000. And then as the that next four or five weeks unfolded, a lot of things, a lot of bad things happened. You know, uh, gas prices went up and, and, and so on. And there was a lot of negatives just in folks' lives and inflation talk and that kind of thing. And, you know, if you looked at the show me heifer sales that were right before our sale in Guthrie, those prices started getting depressed and, and dropped below 2000. In our sale in particular, about halfway through our sale, we were, we were averaging that 22,000 to 2100 clip. 
And then the second half of the sale, we averaged more like 17. And it was interesting to watch that. You know, we've had that sale for many years. And I know a lot of the buyers. We've got a lot of repeat buyers. And a lot of those buyers that were there, you know, again, this is a lot of, a lot of anecdotal observation. But folks who would normally come and buy 15 or 20 heifers were buying five to 10 heifers, maybe one pen of heifers or two pen of heifers instead of three or four. We had as many buyers there that actually bought but we had a lot of conservative, I think it was a very conservative undertone to the deal. And, uh, and I guess the reason I'm bringing this out is, you know, those 17, $1,800 heifers right now, I think, you know, in two years, those are going to be something we, we, we probably wish we could have jumped on. Now it goes back to what Dare said, can we weather the storm and add cows to the herd right now? Here we are looking at maybe potential you know, forage shortages and, and some heat to, to do this. But if we can take advantage of these high cow prices, upgrade the cow herd, try to try to keep looking long term. The long game, I think, is what uh what uh, uh what our, our our good friend there in Tennessee be able to talk on that, you know, keep the long game in mind. Um and 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 and, and you know and plan for the future. And, and I know we've got to make sure and, and survive the present, but um you know, if we keep our eye on the on the long ball, I, I you know, with the way these uh, again, I'm not trying to predict markets, but we are selling a lot of cows, and and I think in the next year or two could be some really good prices if we can survive and have our cows bred to take advantage of it. If that makes sense, you know. So. Kevin, I I still I've always, regardless if prices are high or low, but especially when they get a little bit low. Um, what what you guys sell those really high quality females, developed females for, I, I think if people had any clue what it costs them to do it themselves, that they would think those were much more of a bargain than they, you, you know, you'll often hear them say, well, those, they sell really high down at Guthrie. Well, you try putting together that kind of cattle, that quality of cattle in that condition and all, uh, for much cheaper, and I would challenge them to do it. Well, I agree there, and I'm not. I really didn't want to have this discussion to to say, you know, to, to try to 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 advertise our sales, so to speak. I, I was really, and, and I understand what you're saying there. It, you're you're exactly right. I mean, the the amount of culling we do to get to that final product, you're you're dead on. But it's just interesting the times we're in. I mean, folks are just a little nervous, you know, and, uh, and, and everybody's sort of pulling back and that four or $5 gas and fuel. And, and it just puts a whole nother sheds a whole new light on things. And, uh, but anyway, not to dwell on the gloom. I do want to hit one thing, one last thing though. Um, we are in September. I just want to remind everybody out there that we having a free BQCA, uh, uh, certifications for the month of September. And that's compliments of KLMA. Our Kentucky Livestock Marketing Association is, is uh, sponsoring that again. We just had one in March. We're gonna have the next one for this calendar year in September. And, and in, in conjunction with that, we're gonna have the same kind of activity or event, I should say, uh, at the Kentucky Tennessee Stockyard Livestock at uh, in Guthrie. Uh, we're gonna do it on this end of the state, on the Western side of the state on September 13th. We're going to do a hands-on um, uh, shoot side type BQCA deal like what we did at, at Bluegrass Stockyard back in March. And I thought it was pretty well received. I think all of us on here pretty much were involved in that. And uh, where we do some, not only do the BQCA, you know, shoot side work, but we'll do some body condition scoring there. I think you taught genetics and Les, uh, you, you did some repro uh, presentations and uh you know, and Jeff and Katie helped out with the, with the nutrition side and, and body condition score. So we're going to have another one of those events in sep September 13th at Guthrie Stockyard to be in the evening. I think it's timely because we're right ahead of the fall runs. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there and maybe get that on folks' calendar. Oh, good. Excellent, Kevin. And also the, the online BQCA is free for that month, too. 
Um, so if if you unless you're up and needing to get your new number now and or you or your number's coming up later in the year, go ahead in September and uh, if you can't come to a live event or your county's not doing a live event, do it online and it'll be free in September. That's right. And also remember PVAP is still available. Uh, we want to make another big run on PVAP. Our PVAP people average 85, 84, $85 per head. And those are first timers. So uh, even in the, in the face of all this high feed costs, at least last fall, was a good time to precondition calves. Uh, most most of the time, you were rewarded for it. So uh, again, not trying to predict the future, but uh, don't 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 lose sight of your of your system. You know, whenever we get a few curveballs thrown at us, try to try to stay hitched to what works. You know. Excellent, uh, Doctor Arnold. Um, I thought it was interesting. You and I had some conversations on the uh, about some utter quality and all. And uh, you sent me a question that somebody had asked you. Do, do you care if I read it and, and have yeah, some ahead. conversation? Okay. Uh, this question was: I have a cow, third calf, that has a calf on her that's 12 days old. When the mama started to bag up pre-birth, her front two teats were filled out very large. The calf is nursing but the front teats she, she wouldn't really mess with and only nursed on the back two. We put her in the chute and milked out the front two by hand when the calf was a few days old. I was trying to make sure they were, weren't plugged up and to reduce their size. Last night as I checked on them in the field, I noticed she is still very large on the front teats and they are dusty uh, compared to the back two, which are drastically smaller and cleaned off. I figure as, as the calf got bigger and stronger, she would nurse uh, those front two, uh, but as close to two weeks, that's not happened. Is there any danger to the mama? And then followed up with, do I need to get her up and milk her out again, or will this fix itself in time? Boy, we get plenty of utter and teat questions, don't we? <laughs> I think we get enough. Let me make sure. I, yeah, I'm unmuted. I don't. I don't think there's enough attention uh, paid to udder and teat because people don't think about or I don't think producers think about the first thing that calf gets a hold of when it's born. Bed and manure, it gets a mouthful of that as well. So, um, so many of our problems come from that it's it's um you know they'll tell me well they calve on an, in a nice wonderful clean pasture and so well okay where do you feed them and they say well it's pretty nasty where we feed and they drag their udder through the mud and then you know the calf nurses so um not enough attention's paid to the to, uh, i mean that milk delivery system is so important it's so important so what if she's got milk if the calf can't get it um <clears throat> And that is, you know, here, here we got a situation where the cow's got two, two quarters, basically, that the calf can't use. Because it sounds like they, they, it just can't get its mouth around it. Um, so, you know, to answer that question, and, and people have different, they'll have different answers to this. I'm not saying mine is, is gospel, but... Um, it, it, you know, in my opinion, this time of year, and the, the fact that it was teats are dusty probably not going to be a problem for the cow she's probably going to get she's going to dry off in those two quarters i mean the pressure that's nature at work and the pressure of the milk in there and it's not coming out is going to stop production in those two quarters or at least really limit it um and if the calf doesn't start nursing soon it's they're just going to get dry they're going to dry off this is lactation um but I mean, uh, if if there's mud or she's standing in water or something like that or in a muddy place, definitely those two quarters are are at risk for mastitis. So I did tell them, you know, make sure you kind of keep an eye on her, make sure she didn't get depressed or you see you know, redness, swelling. Uh, you know, one side maybe looks different than the other. So you still have to watch these cattle these cows to see if they develop mastitis because they can um and to me that is uh, 
you know, problem calves need to go. Like you say, this is a good time to get rid of problem calves. That's a problem. If the calf can't nurse uh, all four quarters and you don't have milk in all four quarters, there's your loss of efficiency right away. Um, and that's, that's really important when it comes to colostrum delivery and the, you know, the whole nine yards. That calf's got to get up. It's got to walk, it's got to find the teat, and it's got to be able to suck. And if, if those things don't happen, um, you know, then, then the calf's going to have pro health problems down the road. Um, so I, I think I answered their question, which was, don't go out there and milk her again, uh, because that's probably not what we want to see. What We don't want to continue to have her produce milk in those quarters if the calf's not going to nurse it. Um, better off that those go dry. And, um, you know, as far as, and I did put in there, that's a really, that's one of my good reasons to call if you got teats that, that, uh, that a calf can't nurse. I was just going to say that would, Dr. Anderson would say, give her a dose of trailer, trailer myosin, right, trailer Dr. Myosin. Anderson? All right. Excellent. I've got a question here, Kenny, that I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because it, uh, it's a little long. But uh, basically, the gist of this question was, is if we get into a situation of maybe some drought uh, type conditions or, or we're looking at the possibility of some early weaning, any forecast on, on what the slide might be doing uh, going into the market season, having to sell calves a little early and light. You use the word slide there, meaning the the discount on well the the difference between cattle by weight. Is what you meant? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. <coughs> excuse me. So, generally speaking, in a feed price environment like we're in we tend to see price slides more narrow, meaning we'll see less differential for cattle by weight. I wouldn't worry about it too much when it comes to early weaning because we're talking about such light calves. We're almost to the point where I don't think you're gonna see that, that, that much impact from the higher feed cost. So I still think we're gonna see some really good calf value second half of this year. Um, I, not that I wish a drought on us, but if that's the management strategy that's needed, I don't think the price of those lighter and younger calves is going to be the problem. I think we'll have bigger issues to worry about than just the price of those calves. The slide itself will not worry me, especially if we're talking about probably this summer, early fall on calves like that. Kenny, I got a quick one for you. Um, exports seem to be climbing yet too. You expect that to continue? I do. You know, it's just the, it's the darndest thing. So many things line up really well for this market. And it just seems like we just can't get momentum because we we're, we're pulling cattle, you know, both, both cows and, and calves and feeders forward because of dry conditions. But a lot of things line up well. You mentioned exports. The truth of the matter is these supplies are tight. It's just a matter we've got to get through this bubble and then given where cow numbers have been the last several years where they are right now, the supply picture is going to look really good for the next few years. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I just came from the Beef Improvement Federation conference and had a couple of talks that were uh, from folks that were kind of looking at our international situation and all. And um, at least those guys, Kenny, were really really high on, on exports and thought that they were going to really help us out here in the in the short and long term, really, um, with prices. Absolutely. I agree. But but on the downside of that was is all the supply chain issues that that's hitting that export market extremely tough right now too. But we're still we're still seeing really strong export levels, which, which yep. speaks to how much potential there is if we get supply supply chain stuff sorted out. Yep, absolutely. Well, I have exhausted all my questions uh, that have been sent in. If anybody has any, you better get them in quick. Uh, it's getting close to nine o'clock and we're not going to keep you guys any later than than you want to be kept. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions any of you 
still have. But um, just to remind everybody, we are going to take a break. We're not going to have a webinar in July or August, and we'll get started back in September. So late summer, um, look for some information about the, the schedule for uh, us getting getting started back again. If you have any suggestions, please feel free to, to send those to me or any of the crew, and, um, and we'd be happy to address most any topic uh, that you guys have. Uh, we just need the, the ideas and, and we'll put something together. Any last thoughts from any of you guys? Um, wise words of wisdom that can last these folks for another three months? Kenny, I got a quick question for you. Um, <clears throat> we get to preg checking in October and uh, we, let's say we're running 50% opens because of the heat from this summer. Would you encourage them to sell those cows or start a fall cabin herd? Well, there's been a lot of work done on that. Um, if they can roll them to another calving season, I mean, if they can, if they can avoid going an entire year without a calf, I think it makes sense because I think the market's going to be very strong in the next few years. I generally don't advocate that for a full season, but I think if you can roll them another cat, you know, from spring to fall. I think I would do it. So if I'm if I'm going to preg check preg check early as I can, so I've got time to roll them and get them bred for the next season. I like the idea in a year like this, assuming you you think it was heat that caused the problems and not any sort of issue with the cows. Let me ask both you guys: Would you would you probably limit that to the the younger half or younger ones? I mean, I I don't know that I would fool with that with some of those older cows. What do you think? You can answer first last, but well, I you know, I'm gonna go back to that one heifer thing that John Anderson developed with us, I don't know, 20 years ago, probably now, Kenny. I mean, yeah. is that seems like you've been here forever and that was before <laughs> you know. I was a student at that time. I was a student. But he uh he did a little lifetime valuation thing. And basically, you know, what that data would show, and I actually looked at it uh, late, at the end of last week, what that data would show is right now, if they're, if they're open and they're less than five, economically, you need to keep them. Um, and, and, you know, as long as you are confident that it's not that individual cow and the data from out West would suggest that only 12% of the cows that come up open really have some sort of, you know, biological issue with not being able to rebreed. And so, you know, if you have a disaster and Kenny, we have disasters all the time. If you have a disaster, you know, right now, you know, I think, I think the smart thing, particularly with where the market's at right now, the smart thing would be to hold on to those young cows. And even if you have to, even if you have to, to, to take them a whole year um, and have them prepared and ready to go for next year, but that, you know, there, there, there's, 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 there's pluses and minuses both ways there, right? I mean, you know, I, and arguments can may, be made both, both directions. So, only thing I would add, at some point, you've got to argue, you got to think about, okay, if I'm thinking about a full year, am I better off to keep her another year to get that next calf, or am I better off to just call her and start, start with, with a bread from scratch, right? That's kind of the trade off right. of two years. So, yeah, I and well, the, the thing that John put in, you know, that John put in that deal is that, you know, starting with a bread heifer is not really necessarily starting in an easy place, you know, because you've got to get that bread heifer rebred, and they struggle. I mean, we had that that question from John. I mean, you know, our two year old struggles, so it's not like it's not like it's a, uh, uh, you know, an easy path to productivity for that for that bread ever that you just bought. And it's really gonna be three, four years before she reaches peak productivity. And if you got a four-year-old that you hold over and she and she rebreeds, which, you know, again, there's some, there's some ambiguity there, but if she rebreeds and rebreeds early, she's gonna be closer to her peak potential than that bread heifer was that you, that you replaced her with. And, and with the cost that, Heifers, uh, you know, I think Kevin, the heifers are going to be pretty high here coming up, probably. And uh, I don't, you know, 
there's a lot of things to think about. I mean, it's a really interesting uh, question to ponder, I think, for everybody. Jeff was chomping at the bits. Did you lose your enthusiasm, Jeff, or what did you want to add? Uh, I was just going to say, you know, we just bought in call cows for research project and we were paying 80 to 90 cents a pound. And so, you know, a thousand pound call cow or 1100 pound call cow is bringing decent money. But Kevin told us that bread heifers are bringing 1800 to 2000. So that depreciation value that Les just hit on is something we need to kind of ponder and think about that. Um, even though feed costs and that are high, you know, we, we may have the opportunity to take her one more calving season, like Dr. Bernan said, to try and minimize that depreciation loss. Yeah, I've, I've always argued that uh, selling a, an open cow was an economic decision, not a genetic decision. Everybody wants to make it genetic and it not that there's not a factor that's genetic, but uh, the, the big part of that decision needs to be on, on the economics of it. Anything else guys for the good of the cause? No other questions coming in. So I'm going to turn everybody loose. We appreciate you coming. If you need a Cape code, as you can see on the screen, it's beef bull for this session. Um, and so uh, talk to your county agent about getting that paperwork done. Uh, They're the ones that have to sign off on that. So, uh, but, but the code for that is, is beef bull. Um, we appreciate everybody joining us. I hope everybody has a productive, safe, uh, and comfortable summer this year and uh, plenty of plenty of rain and cool weather so uh, enjoy it and we'll be in touch uh, here again before September to let you know about the upcoming fall program take care